this ability to take control of your body and really just determine what are the combination of foods and the inputs that make you feel your best. And that combination could change over time. And why would you not try mm -hmm. and experiment and try and optimize and become the best version of yourself? Can we continue to eat the way that we're eating right now at scale across humanity? I don't think so. What we're doing to the soil in terms of like abusing it with these fertilizers and pesticides is really just kind of a parallel to how we're treating our own bodies with processed foods. Listeners, I am joined by the meat mafia, and these guys are no joke. We have Salaza and Clemenza. They came from New Jersey, but they've moved on to bigger and better things, especially promoting this wonderful movement. Where better from places like Austin, San Diego, the cool parts of the world. We have Brett and Harry. I had a great time on your show. I want listeners to jump over to the Meat Mafia podcast and subscribe and now uh, get to turn the tables and hear about the fun stuff that uh, that you guys are doing. So welcome. Brad, it's a it's a pleasure to be on your podcast and, and love the name of your podcast. I think it's one of the best ones out there. Oh, I, likewise, the Meat Mafia. How can you beat that? And then the the clever little uh, tweets. I guess you guys are mainly uh, using Twitter for these memorable the, the list of foods and the the stats from um, Stefanson, the explorer that went to the South Pole. It's a it, it's a great resource and it's fun. And um, you guys are, are working hard to build something cool. So maybe we should uh, just start like um, with your journey uh, starting and starting in Joyzy. And um, how did you you know, how did you get into this uh, unique way of living, eating? Um, we're talking about some amazing athletic performances that have occurred recently. So I can't wait to learn all about it. Yeah. And, and, uh, you might offend Harry because I'm a New Jersey boy, but Harry's a Virginia boy. So he, I, I'm <laughs> Northeast, he's mid Atlantic. So there's a little bit of a beef going on there, but still yeah. cl close enough. But, um, but Brad, our story really started a lot of the, what we've been doing at the meat mafia. Number one, it's like Harry and I are really close personal friends. Um, we met in college. We both played college baseball together up at Babson College, which is a Division three school. And so I think, you know, with what we're doing with the Meat Mafia, you know, neither of us are MDs. We're not nutritionists. We're not strength coaches. You know, we're just two guys that have had our own journeys with diet and lifestyle to kind of get to the point where we are now. And it just like really questioned what's gone wrong with the food system and how can we create some sustainable solutions to help make people healthier um, so that's a, that's a lot of what we're trying to do, uh, you know, through the meat mafia and, you know, we can talk about it, but we really started on Twitter and it's naturally evolved to a podcast and we've recorded over 115 episodes and since March 1st. So we've been trying to hit it hard, which is exciting. But, um, you know, for me, Brad, my, my journey with nutrition, uh, for me, it was really trying to find a cure to some pretty serious autoimmune conditions that I was dealing with when I was younger. So um, you know, like I mentioned, I play baseball at a, at a pretty high level and really just justified everything that I was doing is like calories in calories out. So was drinking pre-workout and protein shakes and eating a lot of fried food out of a box and not really knowing anything about how to cook my own meals and kind of just fell into that unhealthy college lifestyle. So, you know, like when I was 21 years old, I was probably drinking too much alcohol. I was stressed out. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't sleeping enough. And then going into my senior year, I started um, having blood in my stool and an urgency to go to the bathroom. And it got to a point where I was pretty much going to the bathroom over 20 times a day. I lost 30 pounds. I got hospitalized and I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, um, which is an inflammatory bowel disease that affects your large intestine or your colon. Um, and I was on some pretty serious medication for that. I was, I was told that colitis is incurable and I was going to have to be on the drug for the rest of my life. Um, and my medication, I was supposed to get administered through an infusion called Remicade. Um, it was like $50,000 per infusion every eight weeks. Um, <laughs> so I'm costing the medical system 400K a year, let alone all the other people with similar autoimmune conditions that are on the same medication. It's like, you know, you can really do the math on how much that, that adds up and is costing the medical system. Um, but Brad, everything really changed for me in 2019. Uh, when I came across Dr. Sean Baker on Joe Rogan's podcast, and he started talking about the carnivore diet and how um, evolutionarily we really have evolved to be carnivores and how 
uh, contrary to popular literature, we thrive off of animal products and saturated fat and cholesterol and meat, some of the most nutrient dense food you can put into your body, but it's also some of the most bioavailable and easily digestible foods. So, um, you know, I went carnivore in 2019. Thought I was was that do on it. your own? Were you still going in for the treatments and part of the medical system? I was. So I think that's an important point is that like, you know, I'm, I'm not anti-Western medicine because when, you know, when I was flared up, like I needed some type of extraneous treatment because my, I, my stomach, I just couldn't process any food. So what I say is like, I think the Remicade got me out of that flare up, but it only got me to a point. Like I was still going to the bathroom probably like four to five times a day and just like, just that overactive. GI and that overactive colon because there was still some inflammation in there. And that was the beauty of the carnivore diet is that because it's so restrictive and you're just focusing on these really nutrient dense animal products, it really removes a lot of the inflammation that I was getting from um, processed foods and alcohol and sugar and grain and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, my body responded really well to it um, starting in 2019. Like I pretty much instantly went down to like one to two bowel movements a day. And for someone with colitis, that's pretty much unheard of for that to happen that quickly. And, you know, in addition to that, my skin cleared up. Um, I had was making great gains in the gym. My mood, what my mood really improved. And uh, I basically got to a point where I got rid of all the inflammation and microinflammation. And for the past year, I've been completely drug free because my, uh, my blood work was so good. So um, you know, it's a, it's a great testament to what diet and lifestyle can do. And our, a lot of the, what we're trying to do through our podcast, Brad, is just, you know, make this information and this knowledge more readily available and try and make these stories more common so people can get off medication and have their own healing experiences. Dang. I mean, that's pretty rare for uh, someone young, healthy, athletic to get taken down. I mean, your teammates, I'm sure Harry was chowing the processed foods and the pre-workout sugary drinks and the post-workout, uh, whatever alcohol and, and pizza fest. So what do you think that is when we hear a story like that? Is this just your, uh, your bad luck combined with what a lot of young people are, are doing? Um, and, and was, was, was plants part of the equation or was it uh, mainly on the processed foods that were taking you down? Yeah, I, I really don't want to blame it on plants. I think for me, it was just eating way too much processed food. And the, the interesting thing with colitis is you would think it would be the opposite, but it's actually most common amongst men in their 20s. And I'm, and I'm not sure why that is, but, and they don't know what the exact root cause is. They think there's a genetic component. They think there's a stress component and then a diet and lifestyle component. So I think I probably hit in on all those because <laughs> I wasn't living a healthy lifestyle. I was chronically stressed out because of baseball and, and school. And then also like my, I have a family history of stomach issues too. So I think it was some combination of those things. And, you know, I just wasn't really giving, I, I wasn't giving my genes what they wanted. And it, it kind of caught up to me when I was 21. Harry, what did the team do when Brett was struggling? I mean, losing 35 pounds, you're not hitting any home runs. Maybe you're not even getting to those outfield balls. I mean, this is terrible. <laughs> You know, it's funny, Brett and I talk about this a decent amount, but it's easy to mask some of these things, especially when you're a young guy. Um, so, like, I remember, so Brett and I were training for uh, an Ironman as he was getting off of his medication. And I remember him telling me about him getting off the medication as we're running along the Charles River in Boston. And I'm sitting here going, dude, I didn't even really realize that you were in such bad condition. But then you know, looking back when, when we talk about, you know, what, what he's gone through, he's talking about going to the bathroom 30, 30 times a day and the implications of what that looks like. It's, it's absolutely insane to have thought that he was going through that. And like people who are closest to him, including myself, like didn't even fully appreciate what that process was that he was going through. And, and like you said, I mean, you made a great point, like lifestyle wise, it's not like Brett and I were living completely different lives. Like we were training hard and, you know, during certain periods, we're eating better than we then, uh, you know, eating better during certain times of, of the year for performance. But then, you know, when it was the off season, maybe you have like a few weeks in a row where you're not eating perfectly um, and lifestyle creep starts to happen. You're not eating great, but um, you're still training hard. So you still look good and people just are, assume that you're you're healthy. But mm. that stuff catches up to you. And, and I think that a lot of young people 
young people, especially athletes, can get away with a lot more than mm -hmm. uh, you know the average person. Well, it's also, yeah, I mean, that's an extreme example where you know I think people can tell something's wrong when you lose thirty five pounds, probably oh. a lot of lean muscle. But I think uh, a lot of people are walking around with um, you know subclinical uh, just irregularities and and difficulties that. It's it's not even worth mentioning. Probably not even going to get medical treatment for it. But you know the gas, bloating, digestive pain, uh, you know energy fluctuations in between meals. This stuff has become the norm now, such that um, we we don't even mention it, or we just we just assume it's normal. A hundred percent. And people say to us all the time too, Brad. They're like, oh, you know, you guys are so young to be in the space because we're twenty eight, twenty nine, and we're like, so many of our friends that had graduated from college a few years ago. Like the amount of friends that I have that probably has like undiagnosed IBS or like they're starting to put weight on or they talk about how <laughs> crappy they feel all the time. It's like a lot of this stuff is affecting young people now too, because we've lived our entire lives basically dependent wow. on processed food. So that's like a very motivating thing for us is to try and help to teach other people that, you know, it's it's not an incredibly complex equation to get yourself healthy, whether it's, you know, taking control of the food you put in your body, eating more really good quality animal protein getting 10,000 steps a day, getting sunlight exposure. Um, you know, it's just these basic fundamental, fundamental pillars that we want everyone to know about, you know? Yeah. And on the positive side, it does seem like a certain segment of the younger population has really become tuned into this and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, free thinking, second guessing the, the regime, the establishment, the, the, the billboards promoting the frozen treats and all the crap that, um, we've had in place for many decades, but now finally with uh, the ease of communication, it's it's kind of nice to see even, uh, you know, quite quite young people jumping in all the way like you guys and um, and going to town and spreading the word and connecting with with people in your in your similar age group. Yeah. And and I would say to that point, we try to keep our message really simple, but just like the Internet makes it easy to access people and easy, if you have a simple message and have fun with it like people want to get involved with it so like the meat mafia is obviously like a, a playful and and fun little moniker but it's also you know we really do care about what we're talking about we think that there's a lot of value in kind of simplifying the message and saying hey like we need to get back to eating real foods we need to get back to connecting with our food system cooking your meals like all of these things are very basic steps to go through to live a healthy, more fulfilling life. So for us, it's like, what can we do in terms of building a brand that makes people want to connect with it? And at the same time, like enjoy the process of becoming healthier, which Brett and I both have, have had the pleasure of doing it, pleasure or not pleasure of doing at a younger age. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's just enjoyable be, uh, being able to share these messages. Cause I, I do think that some of the conversations we've had have have really been valuable for a lot of people. Yeah, well said. And speaking of uh, simple and impactful tweets, I want to read this list of uh, th this this list of items that uh, we recommend that humans eat that you guys came up with on on the Meat Mafia Twitter account. It starts out: meat, fruit, eggs, organs, oysters, marrow, raw dairy, raw honey, bone broth, orange juice, dark chocolate, fermented veggies, and then as far as lifestyle walk much lift heavy rest often breathe more sunbathe create and community those are those are our walking papers man sounds like a sounds like a wonderful life and a true nutrient dense diet that's easy to digest and and going to cover all the bases yeah when i if i could eat all of that and just do all of those things every day i i think that's like my epitome of thriving i, I like i when i think about that list it's it's simple. Most of those foods can be consumed in very, uh, like easy, easy ways. Like you don't need to overcomplicate it. And honestly, like most of those foods, there's no big brand behind it either, which is kind of another thing <laughs> that, gets, <laughs> that slid, slid in there is like, there's not like a, an agenda behind those foods. <laughs> mm. yeah. Brad, the, uh, the dark chocolate was obviously in honor of you too. Yeah, we wanted to slide that one in there for you. I'm Brad. so glad that's in there because uh, Saladino, you know, the, the strictest of all uh, on, on the um, on, on the plant toxin scale and the sensitivities. And he makes a good point. But um, he was on uh, Mark Bell Power Project podcast and they said 
uh, so what about dark chocolate? And Paul says, no way. That's got this agent, that agent. And they're like, forget you, man. We're going to eat our dark chocolate, but thanks for coming to a great show. But um, it, it is important to kind of scrutinize, especially if you're in trouble and having these horrible symptoms. Uh, but then I think we can tiptoe in the direction of optimization, including enjoying life. But I, I think we are on a tightrope sort of thing here where um, I'll get into it a little bit with people and be talking about uh, you know, cleaning up one's diet and, and trying to get as ma maximum nutrient density. And then you'll hear comments like, well, wait a sec, you know, everything in my, it's really all about moderation, right? And my answer is absolutely effing not because the the modern diet is, is so pathetic and the average health status of even guys in your age group uh, or whatever age group is, is really pathetic. So we're comparing against a, a really trashed model and I think it warrants an extreme approach in in every single way to to do all that you can and your ambition to do all those things every day. Yeah, some days you're probably going to miss out on uh, on some of that, but it, it shouldn't be that hard with all the freedom that we have and, and all the awareness and the knowledge in, in modern life. 100%. And I think, you know, a really helpful mental model is just thinking about where your end goals are and where you want to get to. So I think about for me, um, you know, when I'm walking around the grocery store, it's like, I'm really trying to live in that outer aisle where all the real foods are that you just mentioned. But with that being said, it's like, there still is a pull to the inner aisles where all the processed crap is because these companies, you know, I think there's 33,000 products in the average grocery store that are controlled by around 10 companies. There's like that image that went viral, that food web, and it's like Unilever, Coca-Cola, General Mills, Kellogg's, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of these companies have these food scientists that know the perfect combinations to create hyper palatable foods where you can't stop. So they know how to make the saltiness, the crunch, the texture. So it's like you're going for a Dorito and you're you're not eating two Doritos, you're eating half the bag or the entire bag in my case. But I, I, but the thing is, is even being in this, hosting the Meat Mafia podcast, having my own experience with diet, I still feel that pull to the inner aisle. But for me, it's like, I think about how good I feel when I eat those foods on the list that you read off, Brad. And for me, it's like no bag of Doritos is worth it to, it, it, it's almost like that's a vote to get me back into the hospital or have stomach issues again. Uh -huh. So that's, and I just recognize, I'm like, that's not real food. That's a food like substance. Um, and I just, I'm like, that's, it's just a no go. So that's kind of, that's just something I think about if I ever feel that temptation um, to go into some of those foods that you were talking about. Yeah, I guess it's a blessing to have such a severe health condition that you really have to be on watch and know how vulnerable you are. Whereas if you can get away with a lot of stuff and, you know, you're drifting into it more years and more decades where um, you start to become a little more vulnerable, you may not even notice the, the cumulative effect of the stress of eating Oreo cookies every decade of your life. And, um, you know, wh whatever it takes to get people to clean up. Um, we don't want health crisis costing the, the taxpayers, the, the healthcare system, $40,000 every time you go in there. Uh, that's that's kind of rough and, and the pain and suffering that you went through. Uh, but hopefully, you know, that awakening will occur. And when you say it's, it's not worth it, um, that's a nice kind of um, transition to make with your perspective. But I think it's difficult to get there. And I'm appreciating sort of a um, a bigger picture besides the insidious and tempting foods and the marketing strategy. And that is if you are um, inefficient at processing cellular energy internally, you're mm. going to develop a need, a craving, a propensity to go and get crappy foods because you need to sustain your energy levels because you're not good at burning fat, making ketones, uh, mobilizing energy from storage. And so it's sort of like it's a uh, shame on the uh, corporate food giants for tempting us and luring us and putting those cartoons up when we were kids so we could get addicted to Reese's peanut butter cups our whole life. But it's also if we're able to clean up our diet and even take baby steps toward that, um, then it seems like we lose our uh, craving for these wonderful, delicious, addictive foods. You know, they're, they no longer have that power. And I've experienced this over time where, you know, I transitioned from uh, regular milk chocolate to dark chocolate when I was, when I learned that it was healthier. And for a while, the dark chocolate tasted kind of like cardboard, you know, it, it just didn't have that intense immediate flavor. Uh, but now if someone gives me a milk chocolate, it's too sweet. I don't like mm -hmm. it. 
Mm. And I'm not joking for the sake of sounding good on a podcast. It's like if you literally have the capability of rewiring your taste buds away from nutrient deficient processed foods that are hyper palatable to enjoying the most nutritious foods. Isn't it amazing how your taste buds can evolve and change through through diet? I mean, I, I experienced it firsthand and, and it is it's this weird phenomenon, but it, it your taste buds do evolve. And for some context, like I used to I used to work in corporate America and we had a, a visitor over from Europe and we went out to lunch and he's <laughs> like, How do you guys eat this salty food? And we were eating real food. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, this isn't that salty. And then I, you know, started getting really strict with eating um, low carb, high fat and started realizing, I'm like, oh my gosh, the saltiness in this food is, is actually unpalatable. Like it, it's really, it, it's, it's un, unmanageable when you kind of hit the reset button. So I do think that's a really valuable point. And, that, and that's still just like, you know, real food coming from kind of a fast casual, fast casual restaurant. So that's not even like the worst offenders when it comes to mm. uh, abusing that those salt in, in the, in sweet taste buds that are taste bud receptors that are kind of driving that addiction, so to speak. Uh, I'd say even more crazy is how your mentality can become hijacked. And when I listened to Dr. Saladino for the first time in 2019, talk about how plant foods not only are unnecessary, uh, they could be counterproductive. And I started mm. to think about the message and I listened to Sean Baker and I listened to Amber O'Hearn and I'm like, wow, these guys have uh, you know, a, a very interesting and, and scientifically valid uh, argument here. And so I started looking at my daily salad differently and thinking about, wow, could this actually be rather than the centerpiece of my incredibly healthy diet, could it be something that is is suboptimal? And I started to lose my taste and lose my appreciation and my enjoyment. Same with the uh, the broccoli that I carefully stir fried and drizzled the butter over and it's sitting there on my plate and I'm looking at it like, do I want to eat this anymore? And I, I actually, um, it, it wasn't purposeful, but my brain drifted away from the fixed and rigid belief that this stuff represents the ultimate expression of health to, eh, not sure if I need it. Maybe I should, tr maybe I should try eliminating this stuff. And that was a real mind blower because I lost my, I lost my taste. I lost my appetite for salad due to my thought processes, not, not even to my taste buds or anything like that. Wow. I feel like that's one of the cool things about both you and Mark that Harry and I have talked about before is like, there's a lot of people in the space that are just, they're so invested in one particular way of eating that they're almost dogmatic about it. And there's this, this, this resistance to change. And it's been cool to see your progression from, you know, paleo to keto to two meals a day to a meal a day to experimenting with carnivore. And I think even when you came on our podcast, you were saying how you were trying to experiment with more carbs. You were going through like a whole experimentation process there. And I feel like that's so important because um, like that's that's where a lot of the beauty is, is it's like this ability to take control of your body and really just determine what are the combination of foods and the inputs that make you feel your best. And that combination could change over time. And why would you not try and experiment and try and optimize and become the best version of yourself? Yeah, good point. I think we, we all deserve to experiment, especially in your case, Brett, when you were suffering and you were compelled to try a strict carnivore uh, approach to, to basically detox and give your system a break. So, you know, I'd say anyone who's suffering with something that's nagging in the area of autoimmune, inflammatory, or digestive disturbances you owe it to yourself to embark upon a restrictive diet. Probably the easiest one to follow and the most effective is that strict carnivore approach for, let's say, 30 days where you're getting a lot of nutrition. You're, you're perfectly satiated. There's no, there's no struggling on it. And then you can um, you know, uh, assess for improvements in, in conditions after 30 days. And then I think the real experimenting comes when um, you've established this solid foundation that's free from processed foods, especially, and then, you know, see what you can, um, how different things uh, play out over time. Uh, but then I'm also, you know, you hear so much about this. And then I also do wonder, like, uh, you know, not everything is your diet choices. You guys are talking about other points of healthy living as well, mm -hmm. especially on the, on the tweet there. Um, but, 
you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I had a bad workout at the gym. It must have been all the carbs I ate last night. Well, maybe it was because you stayed up till till one in the morning uh, watching highlights on Sports Center. You know, there's a lot of variables at play, but to have a nice, clean diet foundation, that's when you have, you know, even set yourself up for potential. Yeah, I think you see that. We see that a lot on Twitter. There's there. It's very easy to just put so much emphasis behind one variable, whether it's like a carnivore diet or people talk about raw milk or they'll just focus on one thing. And I think to your point, it's like, you know, something like a carnivore diet, that's a huge lever that you can pull, but it's in conjunction with really good quality sleep, stress management, meditation, good quality exercise, sunlight exposure. There's so many different things that operate in conjunction. And I do think for me, like the me taking control over my food for going carnivore. That was like the first big thing for me to pull. And then it was like all these other inputs started to come to where it was like, okay, now I want to, I want to sleep. I want to really get eight hours. I want to cut my caffeine consumption earlier. Um, I want to implement a meditation practice. It was almost like this. um, It was like this, this compounding effect that built on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And I know Harry's got an interesting story too, where mine was like, I was trying to correct this autoimmune disease. Harry was kind of like similar to a lot of other people. I think you, you know, you put on some weight and you started with just diet as like the first thing that you can control. So maybe that would be a good little story to talk through. Yeah. So right around the beginning of COVID, I was, you know, kind of just trying to like shift the momentum in my life around my health. Like I had realized that during my playing days, I could really rely on just like living in the gym and and being a meathead to still look and feel good. And then, you know, I I was always very disciplined in the gym and then would would allow some uh, slip ups here and there in terms of nutrition. And then as soon as I entered the real world, I was not I wasn't going to the gym nearly as much. And I saw my nutrition starting to slide. So, you know, the effects of that are obviously, you know, pretty noticeable after a year or two of living like that right so i had put on some weight and i'm like dude you're not the athlete you used to be man and you want to and now i was kind of like thinking about like how can i break this paradigm and start getting back into being an athlete so i was experimenting with running marathons but i was still like not in great shape like uh not doing not excelling at them by any means and then covid hit and i was like all right like let's figure this thing out let's hit like the full reset button so I went from cooking basically none of my meals to cooking all of my meals. Um, just like brought everything under my own control. I I committed to learning one new recipe a week. Wow. So just kind of like incrementally getting more and more excited about cooking my own meals. And as soon as you learn three and have like three go-to meals, you're like, oh, this is easy. I can I can learn three this week. So you start to exceed your little uh, low, lower bound of, of what you're expecting of yourself. And within a really short, like six weeks, I had dropped a bunch of weight through a keto diet and it was really just like an animal based diet, but I was incorporating Mark's, uh, big ass salad. Like that was a big part of it. Um, you know, cooking with a lot of eggs, beef, basically that list that, that you read off was kind of what I was relying on in terms of a food list. And then from a, a lifestyle perspective, I was, I wasn't commuting an hour each way anymore. So I was able to pick up a few extra minutes of sleep each day. And I committed, you know, a little bit of that extra time towards getting out and walking every day, I was really intentional about making sure I hit 15,000 steps. And so I was, I was basically just doing kind of like, you know, not, not super intense exercise, but I was, I was getting out and moving around. And then I was focused on the diet stuff. And I, I dropped like 30 pounds in, you know, six, six to eight months um, of just being really intentional about it. And like no slip ups, no alcohol, mm. just wanted to, wanted to change uh, the course of, you know, how things were going. And that had a, a massive effect of how I thought about things going forward, where it's like, you just have to focus on the fundamentals, like be be a fundamentalist when it comes to these types of things. Like don't go for like the extreme, like I'm going to like for some people, maybe that works, but like you, you can really just reduce it down to a few core principles, like food, sleep in, in the gym and just start with that and focus on those three pillars. And you can make a lot of progress just kind of investing your time the right way in those three areas. 
Yeah, I like that. Well said. Now, was this in Austin, one of the fittest, most health conscious communities or um, did that in matter Boston. your environment? Oh, totally. It totally matters. I was in Boston um, and I it was pretty since it was the beginning of lockdowns, it was pretty isolating, uh, like which might have actually worked in my favor because there was no social pressures. So like no one was going to bars, no one was going to restaurants. And I, for me, it was great because I was like, all right, there's no, <laughs> there's no Friday, Saturday, let's go do stuff. It was just like, no one's going to do it. No one's going to do anything because the lockdown. So I was like, this is a good excuse to just kind of focus on things that I want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. So Jeez, that's a better story than all the people who, who lost control of their their health and gained weight during COVID. The whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Like, why are you blaming something unrelated? But, oh, no, that my gym was closed, so I got out of shape. Like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, yeah. what about the staircase in your in your building? Like, there's, yeah, there, there should be no excuses. But, of course, we do know that environment's super important. It really is. And on that point, since I've moved to Austin, I've been really conscious about where I'm, where I'm spending my time, who I'm spending my time with. And it's amazing how community plays such a incredible role in health. I think it's environment is the foundation of all of this. Like it will dictate what you do in terms of consuming food, how you approach going to the gym, the mm -hmm. thoughts you have. I think the people you spend your time with is critical and they will keep you accountable and move you in the right direction if you're spending the time with the right people and if you're not mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite so yeah um that's been one of the the benefits of what brett and i have kind of fallen into with working towards this that ironman that we did last year and then you know this year we we did a 100k race we've kind of just started really just competing with like in in a very like collegial way like hey like let's just make this our lifestyle and it can just be the two of us but we've slowly learned like other people want to be a part of it other people want to sign up for the events that we're going to sign up for so um but you know just having like one other brother in arms to be like hey we're going to just make this our lifestyle this will work um so it, that, that's been very rewarding about this whole process of building the meat mafia yeah that's great i mean you're not in the same town yet but um if you don't have that perfect winning environment like dreamy austin texas with all the attributes you have to create your own you're compelled to and you can do that digitally now where you have you know the accountability partner or someone that you're you're right in sync with and um i have uh numerous childhood friends who i still keep in touch with and of course we were athletes back in the day and a lot of athletes back in the day now sit on the couch and watch the nfl on sunday and yes. talk about how great their undefeated team was back in the day but um, I really think it's important to, you know, to to inspire and and bring bring others with you on the journey. If you might be the first person to uh, tow your foot in the water for that triathlon swim or whatever, um, but then also find people that that uh, cause you to to bring up to your A game. So it's a it's a delicate balance. But I think now more than ever, it's easier to connect. Uh, but I, I should ask a question here at the end of my end of my rant and. Um, what the heck are these former baseball players doing going into deep endurance? Like, how did you get the uh, inclination to do that? It's a good, it's a good question. And I'll preface it by saying, I remember my senior year, we had to do Harry, I forget what the name of that 5k was that we had to do in the fall every single year. Dude, I completely forget. Uh, I forget, but yeah, it was, that was always a struggle for a lot of people on our team. And I walked the entire thing because that's how <laughs> that's that's how bad I was at long distance running. There was like a pack of guys that were like, we're like, oh, we're not running this thing. We're going to walk. And I was and I was one of those guys. And I don't know. I just felt like for me, I graduated 2017. Harry graduated 2016. So he's a year older. And mm -hmm. I just left school feeling like I just felt like I kind of underachieved relative to my potential. Mm -hmm. um, I was like I was an OK to slash good ish student not great relative to what I thought I could have been. I felt like my baseball career could have been a lot better. I felt like I could be a better friend, like a better son to my parents. Like I really just like when I graduated, I went back home for a few months before I started working and just thought on a lot of this stuff. And um, around that same time period, like David Goggins was really starting to get more popular and more mainstream. And one of the things that he talked a lot about was like his, one of his methods for self-improvement was just lacing up his running shoes and starting to run. 
So like I very vividly remember going out for like my first three mile run ever, just running it at like a 10 minute clip. And that was a big deal for me because I never really intentionally ran on my own before. And like anything else, right, you start doing it more and more and the momentum builds and you start running. I think I ran like six or eight miles on my own. And I was like, all right, well, why don't I sign up for a half marathon? Do the half marathon, do multiple half marathons, marathons, go into triathlon, triathlon goes into half Ironmans, to Ironmans, to 100K. And it's kind of just like anything else. It's like that that gradual momentum over time. And that's a big reason why we're even sitting here on this podcast with you is that Harry and I were both having really good experiences in COVID, um, getting really healthy, cooking a lot of our meals. And we were looking for that next challenge. And we wanted something that we could sign up for that scared us that would also <laughs> like kind of help bring our friendship together because he was up in Boston and I was in New York. So we signed up for Ironman Waco in Texas which is a really interesting location to do uh, an Ironman. If you've ever been in Central Texas before, there's not a ton going on. But we said, look, we could go do the race and go for the weekend, or we could make a whole experience out of it and go get an Airbnb and stay in Austin for a month and just switch it up. And that's, you know, that's, that's what we did. And we were cooking all of our meals and building wow. off of each other's energy, like Harry was talking about. And that kind of naturally developed into, into the meat mafia. But yeah, it's it's been an it's been a pretty natural progression, but I think that's what's cool about doing things like the hundred K is that I you can sit here and say, I remember being in 2017 and I couldn't run two miles and I was just getting out of the hospital. And it's just pretty cool to see that constant progression over time, you know. Yeah, I I, I feel like the endurance stuff too is kind of this endless pursuit. Like you can always get better at some aspect of it. Um, and if you're not like constantly working at some of it, like your fitness does get affected. So it, it's like, it's almost this amazing thing. And like, some, you can see it get taken to the extreme and be like somewhat toxic for some people, but like for, for a lot of people, it's really, I, I think it's an incredible tool of just like personal development. You develop better time management skills, better, uh, plan, like I now plan my weeks ahead of time, which is like not something I was all that good at beforehand and like really just like having certain days, like this is what I do um, for, you know, certain days, this, this is exactly what's happening. Like I know, I know a week ahead of time what exactly is happening. So for me, I think that there's a lot of other things that happen when you go through taking on such a big challenge that you don't really expect to happen. And then you look back and you're like, oh man, I got better at just like life in general. So uh, that's a win. Yeah. In, in well said i love that and especially if there's you know been any boundaries that have held us back somewhere at some point in our lives and then you get out onto the iron man run course there really is no way to prepare for that i mean yeah you can do all that training but at some point you're going to be checking in with your brain going hey do i do i have what it takes and um yeah that's that's that can lead to some uh real breakthroughs in other areas of life but i think um it's it's not easy to make that connection. And it's it's nice that, you know, you guys have realized the power of leveraging that. Cause I think some people, like you said, they just get stuck in whatever rut. If they're a meathead at the gym and they're not looking at their diet, or they're an extreme endurance athlete and they're, you know, chronically overtraining rather than treating it as a, a peak performance endeavor where you want to do it right rather than just do it. And that kind of stuff I shake my head at sometimes because it's like, hey, these are the best lessons to learn from persevering through these athletic challenges. Um, mm. You know, uh, speaking of Goggins, like he's got so much great content and has inspired so many people. Uh, but then he tells that story of uh, the hundred miler where his legs seized up at mile 80 and he, you know, he couldn't get out of his chair, mm. uh, but then he uh, somehow got up and, and carried on for the last 20. And, you know, sometimes in life I'm thinking, you know, that would have been smarter just to drop out at mile 80 and say, I, I made this tremendous achievement of running 80 miles. And I don't want my wife to drag me up our apartment complex stairs while I'm shitting myself because that's just not part of the the overall picture of becoming a better person through these athletic challenges. So I get to I get to tease them uh, back at them because uh, sometimes we can forget the nuance of these lessons where sometimes you want to push and persevere and not give up, and then other times, um, you know, if if it sucks in whatever town you're living in then then bail and go go start again in austin i mean it, it's okay to kind of move along a hundred percent and i think that a lot of the things that we've done the last year are predicated or 
you know, inspired from a lot of the things that we've done through endurance athletics. That's why I think you make such a good point because there are a lot of people in the fitness community that they, they're, there's so much contention and debate around, you know, long distance cardio, it's not good. You should just be lifting heavy and sprinting. And it's like, yeah, but that's, it's, that's not necessarily the point. It's like, we're not just doing this stuff for the physical benefits or just to stay in shape. Like there's so much power to signing up for a big race once a year that really scares you that you put on the calendar and you don't know if you're, you're ready for it, but you trust that you'll prepare and you'll show up on race day. And like you were saying, you, you like, you get to the start line of the Ironman, you're in your wetsuit and you're like, all right, I'm going to go bike 2.4 miles. I'm going to, or I'm going to, I'm going to swim 2.4 bike 112 and then run a marathon. And your mindset, your mind is just racing down the road and you have this like constant battle for yourself to just stay as present as possible. Like one stroke, one pedal, um, you know, it, it, you learn so much about yourself through those races and those pursuits. And it's, it's an addicting feeling, honestly. Love it guys. And so this was, uh, the training camp for the Waco Ironman where the, the, the idea for meat mafia was born. Like, tell us how you, you did your first step of, of launching into Twitter and then, uh, following that and that uh, great response that you got, how did you come up with the, the idea to kick off the podcast as well? Yeah. So I had the idea of moving to Austin um, in August of that year. And we had shifted from going from, we were originally signed up for Ironman Canada and then we moved it to Waco. And so we got down to Austin. I was uh, working on a business idea with outside of the meat mafia, but it was related to health, the health space and regenerative agriculture, which previously I had been working in real estate. So like this was a totally new field. And my first inclination was like, I need to like really kind of just start meeting people in this space and like connecting with people and formulating my own thoughts and ideas around all of this, uh, this new uh, material that I'm, I'm really trying to like, just dive into. And I didn't want to go back to like grad school or anything. I just wanted to start creating stuff. So um, started writing online. And um I was writing for a, a blogger named Texas Slim and just talking about regenerative agriculture. And Brett not Brett was literally literally sleeping on my floor at this time. And we were just talking about, you know, these ideas, these principles that we had kind of been coming across in terms of the nutrition side of things, but then also tying it back to like really the quality of the food and how the food system does play such a massive role in like the overall health and uh sustainability in the sense of like can we continue to eat the way that we're eating right now at scale across humanity i don't think so so we're like can we can, can we start to educate around like eating properly and sourcing good quality ingredients um and kind of incorporating our own experience of of uh our physical endeavors and, and nutrition so we started writing on that and uh came up with these anonymous names we're both fans of mafia stuff uh, and, and felt like it was appropriate, you know, if you're going to go up against big food and, and, uh, kind of, oh, I get it now. Kind of some, okay. Some of the, uh, some of the, the, the vegan narratives out there that, <laughs> that are feeling some, some gravity, you need to have a little bit of a mafiosa personality. So, um, Brett and I took to that and we started writing in January. We were really like really writing on Twitter in January and then, uh, March 1st came around and we just had the idea. We're like, we write about this stuff. We're gaining traction, but it would be great if we built another medium and mode to kind of get this message out there. And we thought like podcasting has been something that's really, we're both huge podcast consumers and we've both felt like our voices, um, give, given what we'd already written and learned about a bunch in our own personal experience, just being able to put a voice behind some of the stuff that we've already put out there is a really powerful next step. So we were like, let's just pair these two together, this written piece, this, this podcasting piece and see what we can do. And we just dove headfirst into the podcasting stuff. I mean, we did like, right, we were recording like eight so. episodes a week sometimes, <laughs> like it, it was getting out of control there for a little bit. And, um, it, but it was great because we learned how to podcast. We learned how to like ask good questions. We learned the dual co-host dynamic a little bit better. Just like really dove in. And it was <laughs> also good because we were able to get better and better guests very quickly. So, um, you know, we've had some amazing people like yourself on um, and, and, and a few other, you know, 
killer gas. So it, it's been an amazing learning experience. I think both of us are just like very, very excited that we took the step because it, it was well worth it. Love it. Listeners, what do you think? These guys are pretty awesome co-guests as well as being co-hosts on the Meat Mafia podcast. I, I love it. Um, what are some of your favorite um, takeaways and highlights from uh, from guests and from insights that have caused you to maybe think differently or recalibrate uh, based on you know meeting these great people that you invite on? Ooh, that's a good question. And I think what's been interesting about the show, Brad, is we we basically tried to create the show. Like Harry said, we've consumed so many podcasts for so long. We're like, who are the guests that we really want to have on? And how do we want to run the show in a way that like we wish that we had when we were just listening to podcasts? And so we've been trying to attack the angle of, okay, what's gone wrong with our food system, but how do we fix it? So we've tried to have this holistic approach on where it's like, you know, we've had on a ton of doctors. We have people that are treating chronic disease with low carbohydrate diets. We've had on regenerative farmers, farmers, um, different f- people from all these different spheres to try and figure out how do we actually get healthy. So I think for both of us, the regenerative ranchers that we've had on are fascinating because you actually get insight into all of the effort and energy that goes into really raising your food the right way. Like when we say grass fed, grass finished, how much harder that actually is to raise cattle that way mm. when it would be so easy to just feed them corn, soy, et cetera, just to fatten them up really quickly to try and have like a locate a hyper local processing facility so that you can kill these cows in like a you know humane way so the animal doesn't get stressed out. And us as the consumer, you know, we're getting a much better product. So I think just like hearing some of these stories from these ranchers and everything they go through. It's just incredibly inspiring um, and it's motivating because we want to be able to give them the mic so that they can get their story out there and try and teach people, you know, look, number one, you should always be trying to to buy food that's within your budget. So if you can only buy meat from the grocery store, totally get it because you'll still be better off than 99% of the crap in the inner aisle. But if you can make that intentional effort to go actually find a farmer close to you or a rancher, you know, you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to be growing their product incredibly well grass fed, grass finished. And it sounds cheesy, but it's like they're almost raising the animal with love because they're incentivized to care about your health because their their pool of customers is much lower. So if they're not giving you the best quality meat, you're not going to go back to them. Whereas if you're buying meat in the grocery store, it's being processed by a, by a slaughterhouse that's, oh, it's a monopoly of four of them that control mm-hmm. about 90% of all the meat. So it's just a very different experience and autonomy of the food that you're taking in. So I think for me, just learning from these ranchers, which was not a field that I knew much about prior to starting this, that it's been really inspiring and really uh, just influential to me. Yeah, I think some of the deeper conversations we've had have been with just piggybacking off of what Brett said um, with Taylor Collins, who started epic provisions with his wife katie and they were endurance athletes athletes before brad i don't know if you've had the taylor on or come across him before but he would be an awesome guest for you but he's since started uh force of nature which is a regenerative supply uh supply chain supported beef delivery company and then he also started rome ranch which is a bison ranch in fredericksburg texas and they're focused all on restoring the soil and and really just his perspective. I mean, he and his wife used to be vegans there and then they went fully animal based. Uh, Katie was really struggling with some serious, serious health problems. And like, I just think they have a, an amazing perspective on on what holistic health really means. And there was a moment in the interview where I said, what's what's worse off right now, soil health or human health? And Taylor goes, they're one in the same. And I was like, oh, wow. shoot. Uh, they're like you know what we're doing to the soil in terms of like abusing it with these fertilizers and pesticides is really just kind of a parallel to how we're treating our own bodies with processed food so it it, it was just that interesting paradigm or, or interesting perspective to to take and then another one was um kate cavanaugh she's a butcher um and a regenerative farmer as well and she's also a reformed uh pro- previously a vegan, um, now animal based. So it's like, I just think they they bring this like very full lens of like what nutrition and the food system 
could and should look like. And I, I just, I, I pulled a lot of value out of both of those interviews. They're, they were pretty amazing. Nice. Uh, can you guys describe further when we use the term regenerative agriculture, regenerative farm, what that means? Yeah, the, the concept is really about raising uh, animals in line with nature and, and how nature intended them to be raised. So it's low input, meaning there's no chemical fertilizers being used. And you're really using a, a vertically integrated uh, multi-species approach to getting rid of pests on your property so that the plants and grasses can grow appropriately so that other animals can come in and graze on those grasses and then restore the soil. So there's there's layers to the ecosystem that are all playing a part. So it's kind of this holistic way of looking at, you know, holistic land management is is what it would be boiled down to. It's how can we bring all these different animals who play a certain role on the land um, to, to raise a, a vibrant ecosystem that has biodiversity and, and all these um, amazing compounding factors that create really, really high quality food. And uh, we had Joel Salatin on who talks about just like the benefits of this holistic land management, even to the to the level of the micronutrients in the food itself. Like he's saying his eggs are like way more nutritious than the egg you would get at, you know, your your store. So um, that's sort of that would be my definition of regenerative agriculture. I don't know if you have anything to add there, Brett. No, the only other thing that I would say is just to contrast what you're saying, um, mm. thinking about some of these like just really large scale, almost like factory farms that most people see when you th when you think of a farm um, to grow corn, wheat and soy, they're they're doing something called monocrop agriculture. So they're basically stripping. They basically com completely depleted the soil because instead of kind of doing these principles of biomimicry, like Harry's talking about, where it's it's real ecosystem where everything's playing off of each other and the cows are pooping and it's regenerating the soil, these factory farms, they're basically just optimizing for one crop. So they've stripped everything out. They bulldoze everything out. So you can just grow this one crop. Um, so it's very interesting to go out to somewhere like a white oak pastures in Bluffton, Georgia, which we got to do a few weeks ago and just see what does it actually look like to replicate nature and not have fertilizers out there and see all these animals kind of like like beautifully interworking into the ecosystem. And um, one of the things that Harry mentioned earlier is that we had Taylor and Katie on the show. And so after they sold Epic, they said, look, we really want to put our money where our mouth is and buy a buy a regenerative farm and uh, buy a farm, regenerate the land and be bison, bison ranchers, which is such an which is such an interesting thing. But they really wanted to put their money where their mouth is. So they bought this um, like thousand acre property out in Fredericksburg, Texas. And um, the property was just completely depleted, beat to shit. And all the experts told them that it was going to take them at least 20 years, maybe 30 years to regenerate the land. And just by introducing a single pack of bison onto the land, they regenerated the soil within five years. Um, so it's, it's a pretty amazing story when you let these ruminant animals work and do what they're supposed to do, how the whole ecosystem kind of comes together by introducing this one thing. Is it also the case that these regenerative farms can actually sequester carbon? In other words, um, counter this widely touted criticism against uh, eating meat and eating cattle is the, the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but uh, I, I, I understand if you do it right, you can have a completely different story. Yeah, White Oak Pastures published um, when... They were, I think, after maybe after the process of of uh, I think it was General Mills who who did the study with White Oak Pastures, and they uh, essentially talked about how regenerative farming can be carbon negative, and what White Oak Pastures was doing was carbon negative. When you talk about restoring the soil, these cows are actually helping uh, plants pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the ground. So it's quite an amazing uh, process. And uh, uh, to note there, the soil itself is a, is a larger carbon sink than the atmosphere and forest by a factor of three and five. So it's like we can kind of start to right size some of the carbon and climate change arguments that people are putting out there just through focusing on or incentivizing this, this type of farming. It's a small amount of how uh in terms of 
just the scale right now it's it's small relative to you know the entire food system but if we do start to push the incentives in the direction of of raising cattle this way and raising our food this way it can have an incredible effect on some of these environmental problems and the carbon is just like the one aspect of that like uh Will Harris, who we talked to a bunch, talks about how the, the water cycle is improved, biodiversity is improved, uh, a, a number of different factors that all play into just a healthier planet. Um, and so I, I think it's something worth investing time and energy in supporting because it really does have some positive uh, externalities and, and prospects to it. Uh what do you mean there when you say the soil is uh, a bigger factor by multiples yeah, it's, from the uh, the atmosphere and what else? Like that's kind of... And so like forests... Oh, forests are, and the are, atmosphere. ...are a carbon sink and the atmosphere is a carbon sink, meaning that they can hold carbon. But soil holds, uh, it, compared to forests, it, it holds 5x more carbon. And compared to the atmosphere, it holds 3x more carbon. So if you can, if you can start to, and, but what we're doing is we're making this, we're turning this soil into dirt. So it can, mm. it, it can't store the carbon in the same way that it, it should be able to do. So when we start implementing some of these practices and really getting the organic compounds back in the soil, we can get water infiltrating back into the water table and get life back on the land. And that's when carbon can start to get pulled back into the, the soil and kind of balance out where where the carbon is being stored uh in, in our in our planet so mm -hmm. wild so in contrast the monocropping agriculture a lot of which is used to do uh, wheat corn soy and plants so if you're a, a highly conscious plant-based eater because you don't want to ruin the environment by eating meat um we can kind of flip this script and realize that the the factory farming uh, is is a great contributor to the problem um so when you bite into your uh your uh, vegan sandwich you can um you know acknowledge that uh this is this is a big contribution to the the greenhouse gas emissions whereby if you go get some meat from um a sustainable farm a regenerative farm um you could be uh, doing doing a solid it's it's an amazing insight because it it knocks out um one of the biggest arguments uh, and biggest propaganda against uh, an animal-based diet of sustainably raised animals. Yeah, it's interesting. You kind of see this pinballing in the plant-based and vegan community between nutri between nutritional arguments and environmental arguments. And, you know, for the past 50 years, I think people have been, they've been able to get away with these um, nutritional <laughs> arguments, with right? Now yeah. the mafia is on them. Yeah. We're going to find you. We're going to hunt you down and set you straight. Yeah. yeah. No, but it, it's sad though, because there's been this... Um, there's strong aversion to saturated fat and cholesterol. And it's like, you see it all the time with maybe someone that's in their forties or fifties and they start going keto or carnivore and they lose a ton of weight, weight, their waist size goes down, their fasting blood sugar goes down, their blood pressure improves. All these symptoms are great. And then their doctor is, is just looking at that LDL cholesterol number because maybe it increased a little bit because they had animal products and they immediately get them on a statin or tell them to discontinue their diet. And it's such a shame because there's so many people, ourselves included, that have gotten healthier towards running towards these products. And I think that there's starting to be enough literature where people are waking up to what nutrient density actually means and how animal products really are that. And I feel like in response to that, there's this big push within the vegan and plant-based community to now really push, push the envelope with some of these environmental arguments, mm. which is why what Harry is talking about is so valuable. It's because to be able to like really set the narrative straight and talk through regenerative agriculture and carbon sequestering. And also, I think we have an obligation to point our family and friends in the right direction and arm people with the right, um, like, you know, documentaries and podcasts and just things that they can use to really educate themselves. Like, I think Sacred Cow does an amazing job of kind of being like this unbiased documentary and making like the proper case of meat in the environment. And then also um, as part of like a nutrient dense diet which is such a contrast to these vegan films that come out after every few years, whether it's like Game Changers, Forks Over Knives, that are, um, they're very like colorized and there's a lot of propaganda and they know how to make the emotional appeal and the morality of killing animals. 
And, you know, people go vegan, they feel terrible. Like uh, Harry was mentioning Kay Kavanaugh that came on the show. There are so many women that have been formerly plant-based that have come on our show that have mentioned um, like fertility, PMS mm -hmm. symptoms, how much they've improved by switching from plant-based foods to these really nutrient-dense animal-based products. So um, that's why we just think it's important to really correct the narrative there. And that's what you're doing on the Meat Mafia podcast. I hope listeners will yes, go over sir. there and enjoy some of these great educational opportunities. Oh, my goodness. Brett Salaza, Harry Clemenza, the Meat <laughs> Mafia throwing down. It was so great to connect with you guys. Um, you can uh, shout out the, the the Twitter account and everywhere else where we want to connect with you. Yeah, so we uh, Harry and I have separate Twitter accounts. So um, as you mentioned, we are kind of like pseudo anonymous on Twitter. So uh, my Twitter handle is at Mr. Salazzo, and then Harry's is at Carney Clemenza. And we'll send you the links to that. And then also our podcast is the Meat Mafia podcast. It's on every major podcast platform. And then we also have a Substack um, website called the Meat Mafia podcast, where we we release da daily articles on just what's going on in the food system. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's where you can check us out. Uh, what is the next big endurance goal you're going after now? Ooh, I, I'm working on a. I'm running a half Ironman. I'm doing the half Ironman Waco. I've been training down oh. here with the group, um, and, and just really enjoying the process. I think getting some. Previously, I had not been getting any coaching. I've just been trying to do it myself, and um, getting some serious coaching has been amazing. Like the community aspect of it, and getting a little bit more dialed in on on how to actually make some serious leaps and improvements in my time. So it's uh that that's my next one. And I've got another, I've got a trail marathon lined up for the rest of the year, but that that's it for now for me. Okay, guys, keep it up. Salazzo and Clemenza, the meat mafia coming to you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank